The listening part of the occupational English test has three parts, and in each part, you will hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract only once. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you will hear two different extracts. In each extract, a healthcare professional is talking to his patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You hear a neurologist talking to a new patient called Mrs. Lizavita. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning, Mrs. Lisavita. Could you tell me what the problem is? I have a mild gait impairment and cognitive slowing, doctor. What's your age? 71, doctor. I think I walk in a funny manner. Actually, my husband has noticed this over the past three months and says I have broadened my base and have developed stooped posture. My balance has also started declining. I have to use walls or furniture to stabilize myself. However, I'm not using any kind of assistive device. So what about your bowel and bladder movements? I do not have any issues, doctor. No frequency, issues, or urgency. Do you have any headaches? No, doctor. Have you experienced any change or decrease in your memory or thinking? It is not as smart as it used to be earlier. However, I am able to pay the bills. My thinking has slowed down. I often get stuck with the words when I speak. Have you ever had any trouble with syncope or vertigo? I don't have any trouble with syncope, but I've had some episodes of vertigo. I was diagnosed with hypertension in 2014, but no snoring or apnea. Any other complications? I've had arthritis since 2000 and thyroid abnormalities since 1975. Have you had any surgery? Well, I had a hysterectomy in 1992 and a wrist operation after I fell down in 1972 with a titanium plate and six screws. All right, can you give me a brief history of any illness in your family? My mother had colon cancer. Are you allergic to any medicines? Yes, codeine and sulfa. What medications are you taking now? Premarin, 0.625 milligrams. Asifex, 20 milligrams daily. Toprol, 50 milligrams daily. Norvasc, 5 milligrams daily. Multivitamin, Caltrate Plus D. B-complex vitamins calcium and magnesium, and vitamin C daily. Well, after reviewing all of your medical reports, I doubt that you've developed adult hydrocephalus. Your diagnosis reports show blood pressure 154 over 72, and your heart rate's 87, and the weight 153, and your pain is 0 out of 10. Your spine is straight and non-tender, and you have very mild kyphosis, but no scoliosis. And your gait assessment shows that you have some unsteadiness and a widened base. I've reviewed all your x-ray reports since 2009, and it shows a mild ventriculomegaly with trace expansion into the temporal horns. The sylvian aqueduct appears to be patent. Your corpus callosum appears to be bowed and effaced. You have developed a couple of small T2 signal abnormalities, but no prominent changes in the paraventricular signal. I should have your cerebral spinal fluid leakage tested through lumbar punch method. With this test, I can assess your response to shunt surgery. There is a mild risk of meningitis of 2 to 3 percent. Extract 2, 
Questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Hello, Jamila. Can you brief me about your health issue? Yes, doctor. Actually, I approached a physician about my abdominal pain eight months back. On my chest x-ray, I had a possible infiltrate, and he thought that I might have pneumonia and I was treated with some antibiotics and pregnisone. However, the symptoms improved for a short period only, and it didn't cure my disease completely. Besides, my pain had worsened by the end of the month, and I was admitted to an emergency ward. This time, my chest x-ray was compatible with pleurisy, and I was treated with Percocet. However, I was given another prescription for Ultram since I had nausea and was vomiting with Percocet. Eventually, I was referred to another doctor and was diagnosed with splenomegaly. A repeat ultrasound showed an enlarged spleen of 19 centimeters. My positron emission tomography scanning showed diffuse hypermetabolic lymph nodes of 1 to 2 centimeters diameter and an enlarged hypometabolic spleen. Finally, I had my lymph node biopsy on the right side of my neck last month, and mantle cell lymphoma was detected. Two weeks ago, I had a bone marrow biopsy that showed involvement of bone marrow with lymphoma and also circulating lymphoma cells on peripheral smear. And your age? 45, doctor. Okay. What medications are you taking? Estradiol, Prometrium, 200 milligrams, Ultram, whenever I get pain, baby aspirin, Lunestra for sleeping, and iron supplements. Are you allergic to any medicine? No, doctor. Tell me about your previous medical history. Yes, doctor. I got my tubal ligation in 2001, and a cyst from the left side of my neck was surgically removed in 2005. I had tonsillectomy, and I get occasional migraines. Do you smoke or drink? No, doctor. May I know your job profile? Well, I'm working as a project manager. Tell me, is there any family history of diseases? My father had emphysema and colon cancer when he was 68, and my mother has hypertension and arrhythmia. Well, your heat diagnosis shows the oropharynx is benign. There is shoddy adenopathy in your neck, though, and your abdomen is soft and non-tender and shows the palpable spleen approximately 10 centimeters below the right coastal margin. Your mantle cell lymphoma is confirmed, and I would advise that you should go for chemotherapy with hyperfractionated cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone, doxorubicin, and vincristin. Discontinue aspirin for now and continue estradiol and prometrium. Take Ativan as and when you feel anxiety. You'll be given allopurinol from today and hydration further so that you can avoid tumor lysis syndrome. I will plan to add Rituzan a little later on in your course since you have circulating lymphoma cells and I'm planning to get you evaluated for bone marrow transplant in first remission. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer, A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at question 25. You hear two doctors discussing the topic of keeping the immune system under control. Now read the question.
Doctor, could keeping our immune system under control be as easy as managing our diet? Well, for instance, the immune cells involved in multiple sclerosis mainly depend on sugar to activate the disease. However, the common drug for multiple sclerosis, dimethyl fumarate, blocks this energy pathway. Contrarily, these energy pathways are feasible targets to treat certain diseases that might extend to dietary measures. I'd like to be extremely cautious about this because nowadays diseases and diets have become very common. However, the theory that energy metabolism is crucial in the way the immune system reacts suggests that there are possibilities that different kinds of diets are going to have impact on our immune system that we're just starting to understand but are yet to understand it completely. I wonder at some stage if the autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis may include diet as part of the disease management strategy, as well as other diseases where immune system and energy metabolism are essential, such as cancer. Question 26. You hear physicians discussing the topic of coping with a peanut allergy. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What should parents do as peanuts have become an allergic substance nowadays? It is really a very frightening factor to know that peanuts can cause allergic reactions with increasing reports of sudden death in children following peanut ingestion and new products are being launched on the market to help parents stave off a peanut allergy in their children. What I feel is feeding peanuts to children doesn't require any specialized products. Right now, we have the strongest evidence that kids are at high risk because they have a severe egg allergy or eczema, and the dietary guidelines suggest that infants with severe egg allergies or eczema should intake peanuts as early as their sixth month. What I feel is introducing peanuts to infants with moderate or mild eczema or egg allergies in a developmentally and culturally appropriate method would probably help prevent peanut allergies for the rest of their lifetime. Since peanut allergies are increasing rapidly, the early feeding strategy is something that the parents should consult with their pediatrician as it is one of the best sources of protein. Question 27. You hear the discussion between physicians on the importance of food challenge. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. Why are food challenges necessary? Following the recent death of a three-year-old child that had a food challenge test, a new study of over 6,000 food challenges done found the safety profile very reassuring. Food challenge tests are the mainstay of food allergy diagnosis because other diagnosis procedures are not that precise. We have blood tests and skin tests for food allergies, which carry a lot of false positives. Therefore, in many instances, we do have to perform a food challenge test when the diagnosis becomes doubtful. There are a number of people walking around with diagnosis of food allergies who are actually not allergic to that food. Question 28. You hear a discussion between doctors about fake Stop the Bleed kits. Now read the question. Doctor, how do we get rid of the imitators of Stop the Bleed kits? Stop the Bleed is a national campaign to increase awareness and provide training and kits to help the people witnessing traumatic bleeding. However, we must be very careful when obtaining the kit for our locality. The genuine kits are really very expensive that may cost from $50 to $100 depending on the contents. However, there are some counterfeit tourniquets which are knockoff products. I would warn everyone that a tourniquet is meant for controlling acute arteral hemorrhage will cost about $25 to $35.
Therefore, if you're getting them for a lesser amount, you probably won't get the best one. Question 29. You hear a physician explaining to his nurse about causes of obesity. Now, read the question. Doctor, could the bacteria in our guts impact the development of obesity? We often see children eating the same diet and living in the same environment differ in their weight. I feel that there is an interaction between genes and the bacteria in our guts that may be the culprit. The findings suggest that it isn't just the components of the diet, but it's the interaction between the diet we eat, our genes, and our bacteria in our body. Every kind of different diet would cause obesity in an individual who is predisposed to becoming obese. Certain genes colonized with bacteria that are efficient enough to produce more nutrients for the individual resulting in obesity. Question 30. You hear a physician briefing staff about the herpes virus infection. Now read the question. Typically, the herpes virus infect the genital or oral mucosa. They affect the mouth causing cold sores or blisters that form on the mouth, lips, or gums. There may be a prodrome prior to the blister development with a burning, tingling, or itching sensation in the infected. Throughout the lifetime, the virus remains dormant in the nervous system, hence the cold sores which often reoccur in the same part. When it infects genital parts, it is called a sexually transmitted infection. The symptoms are similar to the oral infection of the virus. With the first outbreak, an individual may experience nonspecific flu-like symptoms like swollen lymph nodes, muscle aches, and a headache. There's also a possibility of having the infection without any signs or symptoms. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fit best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear the lecture given by a senior physician to junior doctors on risk factors of osteoporosis disease. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
Osteoporosis increases danger of broken bones. Hi guys, today I'm going to explain to you about osteoporosis disease, which makes the bones weak and break easily. According to a finding, binge drinking may increase the chance of getting osteoporosis in later life. The findings show that drinking too much alcohol over a short duration may impact genes involved in bone formation. Binge drinking occurs when a female has at least four alcoholic drinks in a hurry. However, for males, binge drinking occurs when he has five drinks in a short duration. America's Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration indicates that binge drinking begins normally when a person is about 13 years old. Research involving adolescent laboratory rats was carried out to study the effects of binge drinking on their genes. They injected alcohol into the rats that resulted in a blood alcohol level of 0.28. In many American states, legally, a person is considered drunk when the alcohol level in the blood reaches 0.08. Some rats were injected with alcohol once a day for three days. The alcohol affected 300 bone-related genes in those rats. The other rats were injected with alcohol daily, but the injections continued for four weeks. In such cases, 180 genes were affected. The injections included ribonucleic acid to the genes of some rats, while the other rats, the RNA in the genes, decreased. Ribonucleic acid instructs the gene how to make proteins, the substances needed for bones and other tissues. Therefore, the change impeded with the molecular pathway that is accountable for bone construction. One of the most agonizing findings came 30 days after discontinuing the injections. That time, the rats yet showed differences in the way their genes were expressed. 30 days of a rat's life are equivalent to three human years. It is not essentially correct that what happens to the genes of rats will happen to human genes. But the findings suggest that binge drinking of alcohol by young people could indicate problems in their future. Bones are living tissue that continually break down and then rebuild themselves. However, as people grow older, the breakdown of bone is more than the reconstructed bones. As a result of this phenomena, small spaces inside the bone get larger, making it hollow, and the bone shell gets thinner. The term osteoporosis means porous bones or weak bones. By removing calcium and other essential minerals from tissue, osteoporosis harms bones. Eight of every ten osteoporosis patients are females, and it is very common in Caucasian females over 50 years. Before developing osteoporosis, the patients experience a condition called osteopenia. Timely treatment can prevent this condition from developing osteoporosis. Osteoporosis and osteopenia can be detected by measuring the mineral density of the bones of the patient. Here, density means the strength of the bones. There are a number of ways to measure bone mineral density. The hip, spine, or backbone is used to examine the bone mineral density. A diagnosis called dual energy x-ray absorbitometry is the best method to diagnose osteoporosis that involves the use of x-ray radiation that lasts only a few minutes. Peripheral bone mineral density test is another method to measure bone density that is often used in the U.S. to examine if the patients are at risk of osteoporosis. This test costs less than the dual energy x-ray absorbitometry test. However, peripheral testing measures only one part of the body, and it is usually the heel, the wrist, or the bones between the finger joints. However, a shortfall of this test is when the patient has normal bones in the tested areas and has defective bones in other parts of his body. Then it cannot detect the disease. Therefore, often the peripheral test can show normal results of the patient who has osteoporosis in their backbone or hips. Initially, the disease decreases the mineral density in the spine bone. The mineral density of the bones of all parts of a woman is almost similar when she reaches 70 years of age. In such cases, the bone mineral density diagnosis of lower cost may not have precise results. Individuals over 50 years of age should intake 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day and 800 to 1,000 international units of vitamin D. Vitamin D2 as well as vitamin D3 are good for bones. Milk and milk products 
fish with soft bones like salmon and dark green leafy vegetables, orange juice, bread, and cereals are rich in calcium. However, one should be very cautious about the intake of calcium. It should not exceed 2,500 milligrams a day, including calcium from foods and all other sources. Too much calcium can result in kidney stone disease. Vitamin D absorbs calcium. There are many drugs to treat osteoporosis, of which bisphosphonates are the most popular. Fosamax, Actonel, and Boniva are products of this group of drugs. Now, look at Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the brief instruction given by a physician to his staff on the abnormalities in thyroid functioning. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Thyroid function. The thyroid is a tiny gland in the lower front part of our neck that is responsible for regulation of many of the body's processes, such as energy generation, metabolism, and mood swing. The two hormones secreted by the thyroid gland are thyroxine and triodothyronine. If the thyroid gland does not secrete enough hormones, one may experience symptoms like lack of energy, weight gain, and depression, which is called hypothyroidism. However, in case the thyroid gland secretes too many hormones, one may experience weight loss, increased anxiety, tremors, and a sense of being on a high. This is called hyperthyroidism. Hypothyroidism. This is a condition which is classified by a decline in the thyroid hormones in the blood. It majorly occurs if the patient is suffering from underactive thyroid or glands that control the thyroid functions, though there are other various factors that can result in this condition. Typically, hypothyroidism affects females more than males and worsens as they age. Let me now explain to you the common causes that could result in a decline of this hormone, giving rise to hypothyroidism. The Hashimoto's disease is an autoimmune disease that attacks the tissues of the thyroid gland. Often, females suffer from this particular autoimmune disorder more than males. That can possibly be due to an underlying genetic link. The thyroiditis is such a condition where the thyroid gland remains inflamed, resulting in less secretion of thyroid hormone. Often, this condition affects pregnant women, and usually this phase is followed by a hyperthyroid phase that remains up to six months. The radioactive treatment for hyperthyroidism can always lead to an unpleasant outcome, underactive thyroid or hypothyroidism. The possible reason is that the therapy might have considerably eroded the gland to secrete enough hormone for an optimal functioning. Usually, following a radioactive treatment, the thyroid gland always becomes underproductive for a few months. However, if the gland completely stops functioning, then the condition can be identified as hypothyroidism. 
The malfunctioning of the other glands can also result in hypothyroidism. For instance, a malfunctioning hypothalamus or pituitary gland can result in hypothyroidism. At times, certain medications taken to treat hyperthyroidism can also result in hypothyroidism. Often a diet that is low in iodine becomes a major cause of hypothyroidism in adults. Significantly, the regions with poor iodine resources can have a greater number of hypothyroidism patients. Hyperthyroidism In the hyperthyroidism condition, the thyroid gland becomes overactive and secretes abundant hormones in the blood. The Graves' disease is a common cause for hyperthyroidism. In the disease, the immune system is supposed to release antibodies that mimic the thyroid, stimulating hormone and secretes abundant hormones that are released into the bloodstream. The nodules in the gland, as we age, lumps are developed in this gland that are non-functional or inactive. However, in some instances, these lumps start functioning on their own, secreting more hormone without the support of the pituitary gland. Certain medications taken to treat hypothyroidism can also result in hyperthyroidism. Thyroid enlargement is also a condition of hyperthyroidism that occurs due to any structural changes in the gland. The enlargement of thyroid gland is called goiter that can be unnoticeable as well. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.